Personally, I was struggling to try and make uh, microwave valves and miniaturized, miniaturized valves. We were making 6AK5s, uh, people may or may not remember. And all of that, my boss, marvelous old man Sir Vincent Ferranti, rang me up one day and said, want to see me. And he said, Peter, there's a new thing around that's going to put us all out of business unless we do something about it. Will you get on and find out about transistors and start making them? So I said, all right. So we went away and tried to do that. And then I got moved off that job and found myself uh, in about 56, I suppose, 57, 56, looking after this computer thing when there they were still building computers out of these funny old things called valves. And there seemed to be no way out of it. Um, except we heard that there's some work going on in the university about transistorized versions of these things. But we were so overwhelmed with what we had to do to get these damn Mercuries and Pegasus and things like that going that we uh, hadn't got the effort to uh, get in with Dick Grimsdale right then. And they went off to some other lousy lot, Trafford Park, uh, which was very sad for us. Uh, but, you know, it's one of the carnivals win. But they made a great su Dick made a great success, and he must be counted amongst, if not the father, amongst the very, amongst the founding fathers of transistorized computers. So, Dick, let's hear all about it. Thanks very much, Peter. Okay. <clears throat> Just to show this. So I must apologise, uh, this is a bit of a personal account, but uh, the reason is that's what I most remember that uh, was going on surrounding uh, me. Um, starting in 1950, um, I just graduated and Tom Kilburn said, uh, would I like to be a research student? So I, I said yes, I didn't know quite what a research student was, but I said yes. and. Um, I remember that I got a DSIR grant, it was then it was £220 a year, which wasn't too bad actually because the refectory meal, three course meal with waitress, waitress service, a bit stodgy, it was one shilling, one penny halfpenny. Um, I, I, in September, I remember I was sent down to Cambridge, went to the uh, probably the first summer school in programming, and I learned to program the mark sorry, uh, EDSAC, the EDSAC 1. So that was my, my first experience with computers. And uh, then I came back and uh, Tom said, I want you to write test programs for the Mark 1 computer. Uh, in those days, my recollections of Manchester, I suppose I tried to remember, fog seemed to come back <laughs> to the memory. And of course, I please see it was raining when I arrived here again. Of course, there wasn't much else to do but work in those days, so everyone worked very hard. Um, there was, I think, some great things in those days. I mean, the Halley Orchestra with Barb Rolly and the Manchester Guardian was, was printed in Cross Street with hot metal. And, and, and that, I think, is a little bit of significant, significant of the times because it was things being done mechanically. And that was very much the era there. And of course, there were trams. And then as a lad, I used to make radio sets at home. And at the end of the war, we had a big bonanza with the surplus electronic equipment. We used to go across to Staley Bridge and buy it at 25 bob a hundredweight. And you could actually, I couldn't afford 25 bob, that was much too much, but it would be a few bob. And people were picking up AR-88s for, for about 25 bob in, in, in those days. Um, anyway, um, working on, for my MSc, working about working on the test programs of the Mark I, I learned a lot about computer architecture, and, and uh, I actually was perhaps one of the one of the first reverse engineers because uh, there weren't really any circuit diagrams available. So I, I wrote the programs and went to the machine, and pulled out the valves, and found what stopped working in the program and deduced well that was part of the multiplier. <laughs> um, in those days, the Mark I had its own building down Coupland Street, 
and the electrotechnics department was housed again in Coopton Street and it seems to be either media services or um, psychology or something, psychology now. Um, it was a very informal atmosphere, um, all, all the business was conducted at, uh, at uh, coffee in the morning uh, and uh, there was none of this uh, masses of paperwork that we're blessed with because uh, if you wanted to make a copy, it took a whole afternoon you had to mix the developer and the fixer and do all that. So it was all very fine, we just got on with the job. So um, I spent a year writing, writing programs and I say got to know a bit about computer architecture uh, and, and then um, I, I said to Tom, what, what shall I do for my PhD? And uh, Tom said, oh well, I'll try and think of something for you. He said, well go and make a small machine. And I think he said, go and make a small machine with valves. They've got to be smaller than the Mark I and smaller than the Mercury. I mean, it doesn't have to be particularly fast. So I just about started on that and then the transistors came on the scene. Um, the point contact transistor was announced by Bardeen and Brattain in, in 1948. But um, looking at the literature you can find some pre-war attempts at making things like transistors. Um, effective with the crystal and cat's whisker and uh, they were applying electric fields to try and control the current and they did have some kind of success. They did make some kind of triodes uh, some way before the war, maybe 1936. But of course they were using polycrystalline material, uh, not even germanium, it was uh, these uh, uh, various gelina and, and things like that. The, um, the transistors came available in this country in um, early in 1953, and the, the one that was most available was the, the, point, the uh, S, SDC, and these were point contact transistors. And uh, they, they were made in Somerset, and um, I, I was fortunate in getting a good supply of these. I think I must have got about 80% of the, 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 the output. Um, they, they came in boxes of 10, and, and one day I rejoiced because I got 70 in one go. And uh, I was getting desperate at the time trying to get transistors. The construction of the, the transistor was, was like this. They got this... Uh, this uh, metal metal case here, and these two leaves sticking at the top. So, um, can you all see them? Right in the way. Mm -hmm. yes, um, it was a piece of germanium, single crystal germanium. Uh, maybe something like a, a low temperature solder here, uh, and uh, this metal case formed the base. <coughs> transistor, and then you had the emitter and the collector, uh, and then there was some some magic uh, that was done on these called forming. It took a 0.1 microfarad condenser, and charged the core condensers in those days, and charged up to about point charged 0.1 microfarad, charged up between 20 and 50 volts, and discharged it between the collector and the base. Now, no one quite knew what happened, but it was suspected. Uh, that a multi-junction was formed around here. P and P and various layers were formed around there. Um, and uh, there were other, other ones were made. There was the, the GEC one there. Uh, that was the GET2, GET2, and the Mallard OC51. But the, the SDC ones by, were by far the best. Um, when you got this, uh, this, uh, these, these boxes, they all had to be tested and, and maybe, in the early days, maybe 20% didn't work at all. Um, and then they had quite variable characteristics. But the, 
the point contact transistor has some rather remarkable properties. Um, in those days, we talked about the, the alpha current gain, which was the ratio of collected current to emitter current. And this gets all a bit technical for a few minutes, but it's, it's vitally important that we mention all this stuff because it, it's the, uh, the key to the point contact transistor and why it was so remarkable. So the um, alpha being greater than unity meant the collector current here was greater than the emitter current. So you've got the emitter current plus the base current together made the collector current. And then if I whistle through this in the way that F.C. Williams used to do it, this goes up, that goes down, um, I'll, I'll try and go a bit slower. <laughs> so uh, we start off with the transistor off, and the transistor was never actually off because it always had quite a lot of leakage current. So there was a collector-based leakage current of perhaps one million. So there was a something flowing in the, in, in the, in the transistor. And uh, we, 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 we position the, uh, um, the, the, the emitter, the emitter is, uh, yes, that's wrong, uh, yes, the, the emitter is off. So we've got a negative voltage on that resistor and the diode is on. And being a germanium diode, because that's all there were those days, it only had a 0.1 voltage drop. So this point was at minus 0.1 of a volt. Uh, the base was a bit up in the air, uh, say at plus 1 volt. So that was slightly high. So this being at minus, minus 0.1 and this being at plus 2, the emitter base junction was off. And then there was some collector current flowing. Uh, but the arrangement was to ensure that it was a defined off position, so we used a, a catching diode, so the base was caught at minus 12. So now we rise, raise the emitter, up goes the emitter, and the emitter base junction becomes forward biased, the transistor begins to conduct, and the Emitter current increases, the collector current increases, and the base current increases. And both the base current and the emitter current are flowing into the transistor. So the base goes down with a drop in this resistor. So the base is falling as the emitter is going up. And the more you bring the emitter up, the more the base falls, and you get this turning on very hard. So this goes on hard. You can remove the source here of uh, 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 current from here and remove that and you have the transistor conducting through this diode so the emitter is about minus 0.1 uh, the base is, is perhaps just very slightly lower and the collector is not all that much lower just a little bit lower uh, because the voltage drop across the transistor, the germanium transistor was quite small. And to turn it off, you raise the base up and that reverse biases the emitter base junction. Now, um, the point about this is that you could make a bistable circuit or a flip-flop with one transistor. That was, that was magic. It really seemed to lead to lots of uh, excitement and economy. However, there's all sorts of problems sent to try us, and not the least is the um, transient response. So, um, here we, we, we turn on, these are pretty old photographs, we turn on the transistor, this is the turn on waveform, and there's a vertical rise there which is too faint to see, similar fall here which is too faint. So we turn on the transistor here. The transistor goes on quite smartly. So that rises, let's do it here, that rises quite quickly. 
and remains on until it's turned off the base. But rather sadly, the collector and the base are still stuck together. Transistors are still on, and you have this storage effect. So the, the wretched transistor is not going off until two or three microseconds, maybe. Sometimes as much as four microseconds. Uh, good ones about one microsecond and, 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 and some quite bad. And of course the more, the, the bigger the current flowing in the transistor, it tended to be like a kind of capacitor uh, storage. Uh, and uh, this was a, a big, big problem which plagued me for a long time. However, um, I have to be careful when I say it, but the, it was might be, you could say it was better than this. Uh, <laughs> um, so that was the Mark I, I think Roy will know exactly where that was. Um, and of course here we had um, the F50s, and that's probably an F55. And uh, nasty high voltages. A rubber match with that. Yeah, I, 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 I think I can say that for sure. Albert Nicholson is not here tonight. But in the Mark I, I remember uh, they had these these tin tin chassis uh, sticking out with the valves mounting this way, and there, there were um, pegboards with, with the uh, with the uh, uh, power supplies and signals on here, and they were about above and below the chassis. And Albert got his head in one day, and and Di and Tommy would never turn the power off, so everything was running with the power on all the time. With plus and minus 300 volts, it was in the, in the prototype Mark One. Albert got his head down, he touched the plus 300, got a shock, and immediately went down and touched the minus 300. <laughs> and oscillated for several seconds. <laughs> um, I, I tried to calculate how many watts there was here, but I guess it was about 20 watts. Um, the, the corresponding well, maybe a bit cheating, but more or less the corresponding sort of. Um, I mean, the, the, these things had uh, six volts, six point three volts, point three amp heater, and the the F fifty five was six point three volts, point nine amp, or one point something amp. I went to show a slide actually. On the, on the, on the, on the, Place. So if you join four of these into a circuit, you've got a ring counter. 
and uh, I've actually got the part of the original circuit here um, showing the four, four, four transistors and all the co components as here. Uh, the way it worked is that you remembered the uh, condition of this transistor. When that was on, it was remembered in that capacitor. So when you got the next clock pulse, it would probably turn on the next stage and, and so on. So the memory was transferred. So you had a circuit that was on, the temporary memory here to uh, cause the uh, memory from one stage to the next. Um, we, we now move on to the, the, the transistor computer and uh, the, uh, there were two, it was a prototype machine that was built first and um, this is the, the block schematic of the prototype machine. Uh, memory was a problem. Um, as cathode ray tubes have been used very successfully for the, the Mark I computer, but they were a bit of an anathema for a transistor computer because they had these nasty high voltages and after all they were valves. And a bit, uh, not playing the game if you were to use valves. And they would be far too big, big. anyway, I couldn't get hold of any anyway, so that settled it. But there was a, 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 had to be a rather old drum available which had been used uh, uh, in the early prototype of the, of the Mark I, or rather a wheel, uh, because it was um, 11 and a half inches diameter and, and, and uh, about uh, four inches uh, high, I think, on the surface, made of bronze. And um, Franti made a, uh, did a magnificent job in, in making these. It was quite an art at the time, uh, because the the bearings had to be very, very good, and the eccentricity had to be extremely small uh, because the, 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 the heads were positioned just away from the surface. The surface was nickel plating, which was uh, a blessing. Uh, some people had experimented with magnetic oxide, uh, but nickel was used here, and um, the, 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 the heads were adjusted so they were going to be very close to the track. The way you did it, you wind, wind them in until you go ping, and you wind them out, and you've got a slight scratch of the nickel surface, but that didn't seem to uh, matter too much. Um, the uh, a bit about the statistics. The the um, the, the waveform. The basic waveform draw on the drum. So the clock waveform was a track on the drum, and that was 3072 pulses, uh, which was 64 words of 48 bits. Uh, we, we went in for long word lengths in those days, with uh, uh, Mark 1 being 40 bits. So uh, this, was, this was 48 bits. And so the, the clock was derived from a track on the drum. Um, you start off with an empty drum, demagnetized, and you have to get this clock track on. So this was really a problem. So uh, what we did is we took one track and uh, by discharge of a capacitor put a single pulse on one, on one track. So everyone, every time it went round it gave out one pulse. Uh, and, and then we should have built some divided circuits and so on, so on. But we didn't. We, we actually got a signal generator and, and um, uh, I guess, yes, I think we, yes, we divided it down. Yes, we divided it down from the signal generator running at 125 kilohertz. Uh, divided it down to uh, this one pulse per rep. And, and tried to line up the pulses. We had to do this at night uh, when the waves were very steady, and then press the switch very carefully, and that would just write once around the rep, once around the track, and a bit of skill and care. Uh, and you didn't have to do this very often, so we didn't make very uh, uh, elaborate.
elaborate arrangements for this. With a bit of skill and care, you could get a fairly good clock track without the, the waveforms uh, overlapping. Um, the, uh, the registers, the working registers were uh, a problem in that they could be potentially expensive. So what we used is um, a, a delay line arrangement. So as the drum went around, you wrote on, wrote on the drum here, the information was carried around and go back through the amplifier and rewrit. So that was the uh, accumulator register. Uh, it was an instruction register and we had the address track. Um, it all seemed quite, quite, quite nice. These regenerative tracks would work quite well. This was the regenerative track. So the information was, was carried around the drum. Um, but the problem was positioning these on the surface of the drum. Because somewhere out here there was a hairline crack. And of course, you've got the hairline crack, it injected a one every time it passed it, uh, uh, and uh, it, it, it didn't work. And, uh, I couldn't actually get the drum replated uh, for some reason or other. Um, the machine, of course, was serial and horrendously slow, um, and uh, it was known at the time one way of dealing with uh, such machines possibly the IBM 650, was it? Um, it is that you use a two address code, so you gave the address of the operand in one part of the instruction and the address of the next instruction in the previous instruction. So as soon as you would finished the instruction, you could pick up the next one without waiting for the drum average excess time of half a revolution. Uh, a bigger machine, the machine was extended, what was called rather ambitiously uh, the, the full-scale computer, uh, which um, boasted a, a multiplier and a B register. Um, and the E register was used for aligning words because there was a double X accumulator, so if you wanted to shift from one part of the accumulator to the other. And um, this had um, about, well, the, the first version uh, operated on the 23rd of November 1953, and it used 72 transistors. And the larger machine uh, was a bit later, and uh, this used 250 transistors, and the power consumption was about 150 watts. I, I realize now, looking at the slides the other day, I said, well, you know, why did the power consumption would be quite so much if it being brought down because uh, um, why, why use plus and minus 50 volts? Um, well, it could be reduced, I guess, to about plus and minus 20. But the, the simple thing was that uh, I had these very big power supplies. There were such reactor power supplies available. Uh, and uh, one, one, just, uh, one just made use of those. Um, the the 12 volt rail was was uh, lead acid accumulators, so it was almost a battery operated machine. Um, at, uh, at at that maybe it slides again now. Yeah. So. Um, Uh, that was a, an early stage of the machine. I'm ashamed to say there were some valves in it uh, in the early part because uh, the transistors were not very good at um, operating stably uh, as amplifiers, but the later version did have uh, valve amplifiers. Um, there was the costume oscilloscope, which was in almost entirely re rebuilt whole lots of gadgets here to make it synchronized. So, uh, that I guess was the prototype machine or something like the prototype machine. Um, uh, 
And then here is the full scale machine, which it seems to be photographed as a, a negative rather than a positive. Um, I almost cried one day to Tom Kilburn the fact that this wretched oscilloscope didn't work very well and he got me this magnificent machine from Ferranti <coughs> Paul. Um, th this, uh, this was the input output. There were some uh, little uh, fluorescent uh, indicator tubes there and the drum here in the corner. Uh, here is a section of the machine, so here are these tag strips, and which one of those is an example, with the wiring. Remember F.C. Williams, the only thing he said about this machine really was he said, it's remarkably flat, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and there again, the control panel, I think that's for now, yes, please. Um, at that time, Round about um, 1953, I think it was 1954. 1954. Yes, the, the junction transistor was announced by Shockley in 1949, uh, and um, the uh, um, they, they became available, <coughs> at least to us, in about 1954 in the UK. And they were even more depressing than point contact transistors because you look here's the way that we are putting into it, and this is what we get out. First of all, it took a little time to make up its mind to do anything at all, and then it rose fairly respectively, went on fairly respectively, turned it off, it just didn't go off for ages and ages, and that's 20 microseconds, it just wouldn't go off for ages and ages, and then gradually drooled down, even though it was being pulled down with a good, good bleed down. There was a gentleman called Grimsdell, almost uh, very similar to mine, who was the salesman for transistors, used to come around very regularly. And I said, why don't you have a transient test? Couldn't you test these and select them with good transient performance? He looked at me and says, uh, we at Mallard see no future for the junction transistor apart from hearing aids. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did some experiments with Store. I made a little core store with junction transistors. It couldn't have been all that bad. It was a very tiny little one. Um, whilst I was um, building the machine, I was able to help by a number of people. One was, was Doug Webb, who's a Canadian, a Bugatti enthusiast, who I actually met last year with his wife. We had a very enjoyable time in Brighton. Um, and then um, um, Tom Delaney, I think, uh, he was a technician who did a lot of the wiring. But one of the things I recall, of course, you did a lot of the wiring yourself. You actually, in those days, you actually wired these up with soldering irons. Remember, we, we, we wore white coats, and the purpose of the white coat is you could wipe the soldering iron in your sleeve to keep the bit clean. Uh, and then um, Willis Jackson, who was the professor before F.C. Williams, and has since gone to Met Vic, he came along one day, he says, I want you to take two young engineers and work with you. And he was uh, John Bailey and, and Peter Clute. And uh, John Bailey in particular worked with Doug Webb and myself in building this machine. And, and then John Bailey went back and it was decided that um, Metropolitan Vickers, as it was then, uh, which was a magnificent uh, uh, company. I mean, uh, um, it was the largest electrical engineering company in the country. It had 23,000 people in, tra in, in, in Trafford Park, and they used to make uh, huge alternators and things like that. Very inspiring. And, and, and then they decided that they, they would make a, a computer, and it would be based on, on the, uh, um, the um, transistor computer that we. we, we we built at Manchester University. It was called the MV950. And um, I, I thought, uh, as far as I'm, my memory served me, that it was mostly with junction transistors. But looking at um, the actual <coughs> board here, they're clearly point contact transistors. So it was a mixture of some point contact and some junction. I think maybe. Maybe what it was, it was point contact transistors for the bulk of it, and they used uh, junction transistors for the amplifiers. 
Uh, one problem, of course, the junction transits in the early days was to get a, a, enough uh, power. And uh, I, I remember uh, one company made a junction transistor in a glass, like a test tube, with some liquid, probably alcohol, in it, in order to dissipate the heat. Uh, the liquid boiled. Uh, that's the, the back of the board. It's the technology in the circuit boards in those days. Uh, the drum, which was uh, quite a nicely engineered version. And here the regenerative tracks were up here with nice arrangements to uh, position them. Uh, and here is the Metrovic 950. As I recall, about 10 of these machines were, were built. They never sold any, but they used them quite extensively within their engineering departments and research departments for uh, uh, doing um, uh, their engineering calculations. Um, it probably wasn't very much faster than the machine that uh, we had at the university. Um, and uh, the um, the subroutine time for the machine I've just showed was about one microsecond, sorry, careful. The di division was one second and square root 1.3 seconds. <coughs> How's the time going? Uh, Oops, okay. Okay. Uh, this is the control panel of, uh, of, of, the, of the machine. Um, where can we find one, Dick? You know, I think they're all gone, I'm afraid. Yes, they're I, all gone. I had one offered me from Belfast. The one went to Queen's University at Belfast, and about 15, 20 years ago, I was rowing up and saying, "Would I like it?" And I, I wasn't. Uh, I was rather new at the uh, <coughs> Sussex University, and we were desperately short of space, so I said, "No, I couldn't have it." So I guess it it went. So I don't think there's any existence. I no, doubt very much. Right. I doubt very much whether there's anything in existence. There's a little monitor here, which is like the one. Um, I, I uh, for better off, or perhaps the next point I should say was that um, uh, MV, it was became AEI, but it amalgamated with BTH and one of the other companies. That they then made the, the 1010 computer, and I was a consultant to the company, and I made a small contribution to this, but mostly it was done by uh, the design was responsibility of people like John Gladman and John Bailey and Ron Fawkes. And um, I don't have any slide of the 1010, unfortunately. Um, it, it was quite an impressive machine. It, it was one of the uh, early uh, machines for more for, for business type applications um, and it, it's rather sad to reflect at the time um, their, their first order was for a, a dual um, processor, or, sorry, a dual machine it was a, a, two machines, two 1010s and this was for the RAF stores at Hendon and there was an acceptance test and it was necessary for them to complete a certain amount of work which involved magnetic tapes and various other things um, within 24 hours. So the benchmark had to be got through 24 hours. And however hard they tried, they could only get it down to something like ridiculously close, like 24 hours and 10 seconds. Of course, it was rejected. And the company almost went out of business. I mean, <laughs> the computer department almost closed, and that might be the end of the AEI <coughs> computer activity as a result of that. Um, very tight bureaucracy. I mean, people, you know, they had this spec. They didn't understand about computers. That's what's written, and that's what it's got to do. So it was all, all very sad. In, in 1967, um, um, no, 19, 1960, um, for, for better or worse, I, I joined at AEI, and. Um, I, I worked for one year in, in the hell hole of Trafford Park. Um, it really was a hell hole because it was a, um, a hydraulics lab and everything was covered with oil. And I was there to try and transistorize some of the traditional instrumentation that uh, had been made in the 20s. Um, 
but I, I, I soon escaped from there. The one year uh, I went as a founder member of AI automation was in an idyllic situation at uh, Nutsford and um, there there was the ambition to get into the process control computer business where Ferranti had been and was continued to be I think very successful um, Ferranti was insured yes uh, uh, with their Argus computer so we, we had a real struggle to try and uh, uh, catch up with them and probably <coughs> really succeed. But we, we, we took the 1010 and converted it to the 1040, um, which was really, the, the main modification was to add an interrupt to it. And uh, that was used in a number of uh, industrial automation um, systems. One which I thought was particularly interesting and, and one of the more successful of these uh, was for an alarm, analy alarm analysis system for the Albury nuclear power station down towards Bristol. Um, in a new, there was two reactors there and each had about 1500 uh, contact alarms. And these were con connected to alarm enunciators, little, little lights on a wall. And when something went wrong, about 100 of these would light up and a loud bell would ring and the operator would run up and down the wall in sheer panic trying to, to read these enunciates and work out what would happen. And of course, the thing would be to do, the only thing you could do is to shut down the reactor. Of course, that seemed to cost about a million quid or something, so that was very serious. So they um, had the idea of putting a computer in to, to monitor these alarms. Uh, and, and I uh, was very... Uh, pleased to uh, be, be very much involved with this. I, I, I did everything really. I mean, I was a salesman for a start. I remember going, particularly to, going along to a meeting in Nutsford. Uh, and there was someone called Charlie Fowler, who was a sales engineer, but he was limited to domestic electricity meters. And I was there to sell this. And there, of course, the CGB, there were about 20 of them, and 10 of the nuclear power people, and whole lot of Atomic Energy Authority turned up and in force as well and there was me going to sell this machine and I said yes right oh, okay go and do it uh, and uh, we got the order then I had to go and design it and organize it and to coordinate um, three companies in, in the, um, within the AI which was quite interesting. Uh, we quoted for this we got somewhere down in Harlow to make the scanner for the uh, alarms. So we had these 3,000 on-off contacts and they had to be scanned. And um, uh, th this was done by um, some uh, simple switching arrangement. We got it almost all designed and, and nearly built. And then someone came along and said, hey, have you read the spec? It says, this has got to withstand a 500 volt mega. Um, because the electricians would go around and measure everything <laughs> inside. So we hastily put a few diodes in and, and luckily it did, did survive. Um, it, it was, in a way, an early expert system. We didn't actually know it was an expert system at the time. Uh, what we did is we, we uh, got information about all these alarms. We drew a tree showing how one alarm was connected to another. So if a uh, cooling water failed, a bearing got hot, uh, this drove a pump which drove the oil and the oil pressure failed and so on. You've got a chain of events uh, going through the system. So we, we covered nearly all the walls of this room in quite small diagrams showing all these alarms and programmed this all in, in, a, in a memory of uh, 4K words. Um, and uh, what it did, um, it would display uh, the first alarm in the sequence, any dangerous alarm within the, those that had lit up or, or would have lit up with the enunciators. They, I mean, they kept the enunciators as well, of course, but, um, and the, the alarm that had been reached at the bottom of the, the sequence and warned of any dangerous condition and gave 
advice to the operator what to do next. And it worked very well. And um, Harold Hankins was uh, working in uh, <coughs> uh, radar department in Trevor Park, and he designed the, the, the cathode ray tube display system, which had a remarkably long life. Because when we, when we provided these machines for CGB in places like this, uh, we had to sign away in the contract that we would maintain spares for 30 years. Um, right, I'll move on to something else now. Which... Are they still there? Yeah. What? Sorry? Are they still there? I think it's a successor to it. Is that yes, yeah, yeah. No, the original one is gone. There is, there is a successor. It had a maybe about a 20 year life, I think. Yeah, it had a very good yeah. life. Um, I was going to mention slightly, uh, not, not, not completely within the theme, but something that uh, was also done at that a bit later on, it's the last thing I did before I left Manchester University, was um, a read-only memory for the, the Atlas computer. You may have heard something about this already. The, the principle of this was to have a transformer action with drive wires here through which a, a pulse of current we passed and read wires down here. So if you pulse this wire, and there's a ferrite rod here, you'll get a signal on the read wire. Um, this, this was um, built using the wonderful infrastructure we had in Lancashire in those days. Uh, there was a firm called Greenings who did wire weaving for mostly for filtering um, for, for, for filters for um, gold, um, riddles and things like that. Um, and uh, we, we had them uh, uh, weave a, a mesh uh, for this. Um, and uh, we, we, we uh, inserted a ferrite rod there. And there were some other rods which were called keeper rods. So the magnetic flux would return via, via these if there was a so-called information rod. Uh, the drive circuit was a terminated transmission line, so there was a terminating resistance here. So you applied a voltage across here, sent a pulse along here, and if there was a ferrite rod here, you could see on the read wire, and uh, it later uh, had copper rods here, uh, which were anti ones, and they, they were zeros to, to, to uh, um, produce a, a low signal. Um, so this was the, as I say, it's rather personal list, so my connection with the Atlas computer, which was of course a valve machine, and we had some very much better trans sorry, a transistor machine, I should say, it was a transistor machine, we had some very much better transistors, and then the number escaped me at the moment, that these were um, uh, particularly good at switching. OC170s? Hmm? OC170s? Really? No, no. no. AC1211. Maybe, maybe, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, I won't dwell on this too much, but there there was uh, uh, a matrix for, for doing the drive wire selection and uh, the, the read wire uh, selection. Um, we, we could select eight, eight read wires by switching, uh, and, and this made use of this uh, very nice property of, of saturating the transistor, it became a switch, which was used very successfully for the, the adder circuit. Uh, the, this is a bit cheating, this, because this is the, the way from off the mesh. Uh, I realized too late that I hadn't got the, the way from off the the, the uh, output of the amplifier. So the amplifier was a bit more sluggish. But it was fairly fast in those days. Uh, and um, you've got a nice little signal out here after only a few uh, million microseconds, as we call them. Nanoseconds, we didn't know what a nanosecond was in those days. Um, this one next. This 
this, yes, this was the, the prototype of the read only memory. I think you get some negative. Um, there was a sheet of Paxlin here, and this was about five foot high by about um, uh, maybe four foot wide or something. Yeah. A bit taller than five foot. Um, and this was covered with plasticine, and, and then the mesh was laid on this plasticine, and uh, uh, this had um, the 52 bits of the, uh, the Atlas Word here with the, the read circuits here, and it was a capacity of uh, 8K words. Um, we, 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 um, we had a number of problems with this. First of all, uh, we had a struggle getting the, the mesh woven. The, the, these rods were like um, propelling pencil leads, about one millimetre diameter. And uh, these were made in Blackburn by Mullards. It was a great deal of difficulty and they weren't really very interested anyway in trying to get them a, a, a uniform diameter. So uh, it was quite a difficult job actually anyway to try and extrude these uh, and do the, the ferrox cube process on these ferrite rods. And when we got them, they all had to be cut up to a certain length. And then there was a problem putting them in. So um, we had a little jig which inserted uh, about uh, four lots of eight, I guess, in one go. Of course, in order for the jig to work, we had to have a good spacing reliable spacing, uniform spacing. So we got these samples of these wire mesh and every so often there would be some discontinuity in the spacing, it would be slightly wide or narrow. And we complained about this and they said yes, we'll do it better next time. And, it, and Tom was getting more and more angry about this and he said go over there and find out what's going on. So if I went over to Warrington and discussed this with them and I said, what happened about this? And I talked about the man who did it. He says, oh, that's where we had the tea break. <laughs> so we, we got it made and uh, we, we had uh, two girls for Auntie. They spent six weeks filling the entire thing with ferrite rods and, uh, and uh, they were painted in different colours. And then Frank came along and pulled some of them out uh, where he wanted the zeros. Uh, it was a critical thing that when they did it at West Dog, it was flat. Yeah. It was mounted vertically. Yeah, so she was so who did they choose to put the ones at the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. So the bottom is not going to be far. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to share an office with Dick, so we can't really share an office with Dick. <laughs> um, we, we occasionally had moments of madness. Uh, and um, What do you mean occasionally? <laughs> well, yeah, it'd be quite regular. Um, I thought it might be a good idea to make this writable, so this, this memory could be written as well. So, um, if, if we had a little ferrite rod, and we had it in a little nylon tube, and we moved it up and down, and had the wiring done appropriately, like that, and then, um, it was the time of the um, uh, Hungarian Revolution, or what it was, and uh, we were very fortunate to have um, uh, an escapee called uh, Tom Zombri Moldovan, and he, he, he came across and he actually worked with me, and uh, we, 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 we discovered his talents gradually. We didn't quite know what his talents were, but we, we discovered very rapidly he was extremely good at making things and, and, and doing mechanical design. So, so he actually built this machine. Which was the, the, the changeable store. And the idea of this was fairly simple. There would be all these nylon mouldings here with the wires and there would be this carriage which would run up and down this steel bar and this would carry air jets which were controlled by some master valve here and jet selection valves and as it went along it would blow the rods from one end to the other. Mm. 
and it was quite a nice idea really. Um, and it failed because we didn't know about nylon. And um, the problem was that the nylon was hygroscopic and changed its diameter, uh, its dimensions, so we couldn't get dimension stability with, with, with the material. And as it all been wired up, it was abandoned, so it was, it was a failure. Um, I, um, the, the other transition from valves to uh, transistors that I, I'd like to mention is something which I've continued to have an interest in, and, and that's in, di in display systems. And uh, one of the things we, we did was to um, produce a display for the Mercury computer. I don't know why it's such a rotten slide, but uh, the floors look terrible and... Uh, it worked. It worked. <laughs> um, so here's the Mercury, uh, a, a wonderful machine, I think. And here is the display that uh, Mike Barrettoff and myself uh, put together. It had two cathode ray tubes, one here, it was a nine inch flat faced electrostatic deflection tubes. Uh, and um, I think they were specially made for us by GEC. Uh, they were certainly a special order. And there was one at the back with a with a 35 millimeter camera, which was had an electric motor, which uh, would be uh, driven by the, the computer to take the next exposure. Um, the uh, one or two. Here it is. The, the, the organisation of, of this machine was, was quite simple, this display. It was an 8-bit D to A converter, um, which uh, was done in two stages. Uh, and, and then um, the 8 bits came out in, in, in one, at one time from the, from the, the Mercury. Uh, and then, so the X came out first of all, and then later the Y value came out, and it was necessary to store uh, the X and Y values. So um, we could have stored it in digital form, uh, but that would have been fairly expensive because this machine was built to quite a tight budget, about 500 pounds I think at the time. Um, and so the idea was to use analog storage. So here was the D to A converter, which is very simple. And then the, the analog storage was done on this capacitor, and there was a switching arrangement. So the uh, input signal here uh, was sent in through this amplifier. We compared it with the feedback, and this adjusted the value. And when it was right, the, uh, the diodes were, broke this uh, feedback circuit, and the information was stored. And uh, this was, uh, uh, had a 256 by 256 resolution uh, and it could be used for very crude alphanumeric displays. Uh, it was a little better than that because the photography is blurred it a bit. There were separate dots actually, so it's blurred it and you could draw waveforms or do numbers. And it was quite a fast output, excepting that if you want a hard copy you had to wait for two or three days while the film was developed. Um, I, I, uh, we move on now to uh, the the, um, the transistor area, and I, I think we should. This is now at Sussex University, and um, throughout my uh, experience with working with uh, hardware, there's been periods at which hardware has been extremely difficult to make and extremely easy uh, and um, so uh, you start off with valves and valves were perhaps okay but a tremendous amount of labour building a valve machine and then the transistors came along but they were very hard to get uh, but once they were available it became easy uh, and then things got very big and complicated uh, like the Atlas so you could hardly build an Atlas uh, in, in, a, in a few weeks um, and, and then the microprocessor came along. Of course, the microprocessors weren't available uh, 
that right at the beginning, but as they became a lot available, it was possible to put some things together quite quickly. And um, th this, um, that's Aris Hagislanis, who obviously looks like a Greek and is a Greek. Um, and uh, he is a uh, general manager for a GSM in Athens now. Greeks are doing very well. Um, the, the, the idea here was to do the rasterization of polygons on the screen. And this was an object-based system, that is that you took the original polygon objects and assigned them to one of the processors. And there were some eight, eight processors, um, or as many as we uh, could afford to build here. And each processor looked after one polygon. And it, it was a time-sharing system, so that the polygons were uh, allocated dynamically to the processors and as soon as one polygon had been drawn, um, that processor was available to take on another one. Um, it was quite interesting in, in, in the sense that it had switches here, and you could turn these processors off and on. There were Z80s. And the display would continue to function without interruption as you switched in the, poly as you switched in the processors on or off, as long as there was enough of them to generate the picture because they rasterized direct, directly onto the screen and there was uh, no frame stored. Uh, that was a cool display that we got, this fairly elementary. Um, oh, this was a, another venture where we were doing real-time texture generation and this went on to the uh, uh, TRW multiplier chips where we uh, put some of these together and got uh, um, a, a processor which did first order ray tracing of texture patterns onto a display. So what we could do is you could alter the orientation of this in real time and you could fly this and it would paint these texture patterns on. And the uh, processors, uh, the system had about 170 megaflops throughput which was quite fast in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 80s. About the 80s. And finally, to end up where we are today, um, th th this, um, these two, two slides are uh, very elementary examples of um, a, a display chip that we, we've just built, one with uh, the so-called smooth shading and the other with the, uh, the fong shading, although that requires extra processing. Um, how, how we do this is to have the traditional geometry pipelining for starting with um, a database consisting of effectively a triangulated model to perform the geometry uh, translation, rotation and perspective projection and then to rasterize on the screen. So we have the job of painting these pixels that the right colour and doing hidden surface removal. And uh, so coming right almost to the present day is an ASIC drawing engine which we designed. And of course this has to be built now in a foundry, it was built in the ES2 in France. And uh, this So we go from valves to, right to ASICs now, and uh, old fashioned technology, I guess, one micron. Um, uh, and this has been working for more than a year. We have a workstation with this in, uh, 35,000 gates, and um, it will rasterize between 300,000 and a million uh, triangles per second, or a million vectors per second, or 20 million uh, pixels per second. And this is the sort of thing we're up against now. It's a very simple chip by, by, by modern day standards, but um, uh, it, it's uh, something that uh, we, we, we designed with another university and a French company, uh, and, and that was the chip. So there we are, about transistors. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That was uh, 
certainly a trip down memory lane, and then right up, right up to date. Um, those point contact transistors, um, it was a long time before we got out of those, wasn't it? Yes. Um... I, remember, I remember in the early days of Ferranti, when we were asked to make transistors, just to what the hell we should do, and we were very tempted to make those and decided we wouldn't, but uh, very luckily, I think, really. Anyway, questions? Comments? Well, we've had a, some ideas about rebuilding some of these old machines, Dick. You wouldn't like to take on a project of rebuilding the 950 or something, would you? Yes, yeah, so it might be a simulation. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way you could get the transistors for it. No. You have some transistors you could probably raise or find something that would do instead. We could make some. No. Why couldn't we make some? You shout it out already. <laughs> Yeah, could, 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 we simulate, could we simulate 950? That's the simulation oh, yes. well. We know, all about, know enough about yeah. it, do we? Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, there's, there's, there's got enough information to, yeah. uh, to do a yeah. simulation. Yeah. It, nice it, it was a reduced instruction set computer. <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs> <laughs> See, what we're thinking, Dick, is that, as you probably know, uh, the Americans have got terribly excited about 1996 yeah. as being the 50th anniversary of the first computer to work, which they allege to be any you see. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas we reckon it's 1998 that all this has got to be done. Yeah. So we want to do a lot more things in 1998 than, yeah. than, than they're doing, yeah. to point yeah. out the error of their ways. I bet they're not going to build a linear replica, are they? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think they are, no, no, no. But you know, we, we have a you know a Colossus pretty well working now. You know, which is about the same as ENIAC, I suppose, isn't it? Oh no, Colossus is much smaller than ENIAC. ENIAC. Oh, much smaller, yeah. But was it eighteen thousand pounds? Eighteen thousand pounds, was it? Yeah. 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 About, uh, out of the about 250 transistors, about two, as I wrote in the paper, required attention each week. What it meant was that they wouldn't go off properly. And the, uh, what one did was to increase the base current by putting another resistor in parallel with the base bleed to, to help them to go off. But did you have to condition all of them when they arrived, or was that done at, before they were supplied? This, you said they were. Uh, no, this was in service. Yeah, but before service, did you have to condition them? Uh, yeah. We used to test them. So, so we used just to test, test them. Service, yeah, yeah. The actual form, the, the forming. The forming, you didn't have to do the forming yourself. It was done in the factory. That was done in the factory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what you're saying is these point contact transistors yeah. actually aged? Well, I think it was ingress and moisture, because yes. there wasn't a very good seal at the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't actually tried this out, but the, I did a very quick check with a, a meter and, and I found the point contact transistor exhibited the, 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 the diode, uh, the base and the emitter, the collector and emitter diode. Correct. Still? For, for, for the SDC one, but not for the others. The others were just open circuit. Well, I mean, you ought to put power on that board. I will do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> very, very carefully. Yeah, very carefully, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you see, I, I didn't realise that none of the 950s went into external for service. They all stayed inside Metvix. Not immediately. They, they did go out afterwards. Uh, so one did go to Queen's University of yeah. Belfast for a start. I don't know where, <coughs> I don't know where the others went. They, weren't, they, they, um, they didn't know really how to sell computers in, in, in no, the no, early no. days. And, uh, Except I remember yeah. Paul yeah. Bowden saying with the, I think the Mark I, he says, selling computers is like selling lighthouses. That's don't right. sell very many. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the magnetic wheel and yeah. the stuff around that, of course, is very interesting because uh, most magnetic drums used common read-write head, mm. and therefore you uh, were not too fussed about the circumferential position of the mm. head. Um, now you were exploiting separate read-write heads, so yeah. so you had to be very fussy about the distance between those two. Yes. Yes. Um, Otherwise, you, 
you delay on the spot next. That's right, yeah, yeah. But, well, I mean, was that just carefully hit it with a hammer? I mean, that was a very nice, nice, nice little screw, screw adjustment oh, that was, 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 was made by a, little, a little jig. I think Doug Webb devised this actually, and he did it by straining a piece of metal by driving a oh, wedge into it to, to get a very small adjustment. And but the one of the problems, of course, is the direct pickup between the right head and the right yeah, head. I was going to ask you about that. That was a problem. Terrible trouble with that on the ferrite. How far apart would they be? Half an inch, half an inch, yeah. half an inch for one, one for twelve bits. Yeah. So did you did you yeah. without screen? I did try a new metal screen, various screens, but uh, a bit of copper screen. And eventually, I found I could get away with it. It's all right. How many accumulators were there? Um, the, the, there was the um, registers, the, there was the one double length accumulator register, which was um, the, 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 the word length I, I said was um, 48 bits, and it was divided into four syllables, and the four syllables uh, were 12 bits, and one bit was used for so called engineering purposes for switching, so the words were. Uh, four lots of 11 separated by gaps, so it was a 44-bit word. The Q-meter was a double double length word. There was the E-register, which was a single length, which was used for shunting words from one half of the Q-meter to the other. Uh, the instruction register, which was a single length word. Um, and there was an eight-word B-register. And were these all implemented as regenerative? Yes, yes. So they were all separate tracks? On separate the tracks, yeah. yeah. Absolutely no reason why they shouldn't have been on one track. If you could <laughs> lose them. Uh, if you were short of space, and when you did put them on the track, they might have been. Everybody was from different <laughs> locations <laughs> where they were, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a neat idea. Neat idea. In fact, you can imagine a very nice architect with one right head and several read heads. So that you could see what's in your register and what was in it last time and what was in it last time. <laughs> that was what you made quite interesting with the detail there. I think someone thought about something. Starting an enhancement program already? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the serial machines were very nice, really. Very simple. Nick, I came and visited you when you were building that transistor machine. The thing I remember vividly about it was that you were in what Appeared compared with where I've seen computers before to be a cold, dark cellar. Was it really cold in there? I mean, I know the machine it, wasn't making as much heat as the uh, it, it, the mercury in the marble. Well, it wasn't. I don't think particularly cold. It wasn't a cellar. It was upstairs on the, <laughs> the first floor, but but it had these lavatory tiles around the wall. Yeah, it yeah. high windows. It had very high windows. Yes, yeah. yes, high windows and. Uh, uh, I mean, you didn't get the heat that you got from the valve machine, oh, no. of course. But it wasn't the room where the baby machine was built, was it? The original the, the, that was a floor above. Oh, I see. The same building. Yes, yes. The thing I remember about that visit you door so well, that was the battery room next door. You see, the, how many of those cells did you have? Um, we didn't use those batteries for the uh, any of the machines. Of post office cells. There was there was a huge battery that that was for the DC machines and there's a, a rather sad tale about that because there was a, a senior lecturer called Harold Gerard who, who taught machines and he uh, was quite old when I was a student and he'd had these battery batteries designed and so on installed with this wiring everywhere uh, for distribution of, of these cells and. Uh, with, uh, People like Tom and I used to go and pack all of this wiring away to make room for the, the baby machine. Harold Joe, I've never said anything to see it was rather sad <laughs> this being this technology being replaced. It had nothing to do with the transistors, but one of the big advances in technology that West Gart made was when he started making hair brushes. Uh, I was going to mention it did yeah. yes, yes. Glib talk about this fixed store. Mm. Putting it into production wasn't all that easy, mm. was it? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Grimstone? That's yes. right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. No, no, no. All these little guns stick. Making well, hairbrushes. Well, hair making hairbrushes. The <laughs> hairbrush was, uh, as Dick said, we put ferret rods or copper rods with keepers. Mm. So they, you had 
16 bits, 16 information bits, and 16 keepers. Is that right? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, keepers yeah, keepers are on, yeah. on one hairbrush, which was about so big, it's in plastic. And you plug these into the mesh. Uh, the early one was good because you stuck them in with pl in plasticine, so you knew you'd got them in, and you knew they were staying in. Except that the plasticine dried out and they fell out. That was, that was a good design, really. So the bits falling out of the store on the Mark 1 for one reason. The bits fell out of the store on the Atlas because the store got dried and fell out. The hairbrushes were held in by pure friction. There were so many bits that they, they plugged in moderately tightly, so they were held in. A little stipple rip, not they? That's right. But then the trouble was that the, you could walk past the big store and cause it to fail because you shoot the hairbrushes out and they'd fall out backwards. <laughs> so they then had to design plastic packs to hold them in with spring clips on them. He went on, it was like a Heath Robinson thing. Every, every solution needed another solution to make it work. <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was the fact that it was the fastest memory in the world. I mean, that yeah, was, yeah. second memory or so it was incredible speed. We kept all the store, all the main programs of the supervisor and all the test programs on there. So it was like a read only, well, it was a read only memory, but it was like a read only memory in a modern PC where you. You had a read only memory, you switched it on, and all the programs that were, nested, that were there to get you started were all in the machine. So that's what this one did. But, and the operating system was there just because it was a bit much of a way to do it. Well, the extra code, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. so that's right. Made, made I can't remember money. how much, but it was very, very expensive. <laughs> oh, it was, well, you could show it to any visitor, they were very impressed. We don't rest the back of the transistors. The number of girls we had putting all these bloody things in. <laughs> Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the 1010. Uh, did, they, did, did they ever sell any of those apart? Or the, the RAF the, Yes, there was one or two others. Yeah, sold, yeah, yes, yeah. That's right. I remember when it was selling in competition with Leo 3 and uh, yeah. Orion. Yeah. And uh, the KDF 9, I suppose. A bit. Probably, yeah. Mm. They, they claimed uh, that it was the first British machine to be demonstrated doing parallel programming, but I don't know how that. That's mm -hmm. for commercial applications, but I don't know whether that was. Well, really <laughs> it was a good story. But some would say it was Neo Three. Some would say it was Orion. Yeah, parallel. Yeah, yeah. not concurrent. You mean actually the yeah, yeah, um, machine separate? No, no, no. It was just, uh, switching from one yeah, program to the other. Yeah, yeah. But. Uh, they were strange days those days. When I remember when the 1010 was selling in competition with Orion, and I think it was a, one particular customer, it was Orion, KDF9, or the 1010. Mm -hmm. And there was one guy, we'd all put in bits, and the guy came along to me and said, My house was too much, uh, couldn't be reduced. So I said, Long argument, we reduced it a bit, you see, reduced the price a bit. So that's fine, I'll let you know, you see. And about two weeks later, he came back and said, well, I went across to Angel Electric and told them your price, and they've gone down to that. <laughs> so I said, good day, sir. <laughs> you've, you've just gone going round and round and round. Yeah, well, yeah. The three companies just saying, just, you know, we're going to give the damn thing away, isn't it? I mean, more or less getting it away anyway. I remember, I think the, I mean, it was always about £100,000 for these machines, yeah. and I think the 1010 was about £100,000. We, 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 uh, we sold an alarm analysis system to ASIA for the Marvin King uh, nuclear power station and, and the job was running very late and um, um, that they had everyone concerned with the production of the machine in the research hall at Traffic Park, about 300 people, and the Swede uh, proceeded to tear us all off a strip for late delivery uh, and um, they got very upset about this. So. Um, we had some OR people in, in, um, in AI automation in Nutsford, so we sent them into Westworks in Trumpet Park to try and find out why, why <coughs> the hardware manufacturer was, was uh, taking so long. And Westworks 6 at that time uh, made these huge radar in installations, uh, re really massive things. And they came back about three days, about three days later and they said, 
Well, the, the measure they use for the scheduling and, and the, the way in which the superintendent uh, of the factory is judged is on tonnage. <laughs> Good away as any. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, any more questions? Comments? I was very pleased to see in that um, eight processor, microprocessor shading engine that you were reusing vintage hardware. The power supply was out in 1904. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> 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 I've got another one at home, actually, yeah. yeah. The 1904, we'd like to get that out um, well. I've got some power supplies. Oh, not the whole machine. No, 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 the power <laughs> Well, Dick, thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure having you here, and uh, the rest of luck. Thank you okay. very much. Well, gentlemen, our next meeting is... February the 7th. 